and welcome to Hacking the Exile, the show that gives you that extra material that you need to really appreciate the Exile 60 webisodes. Uh, I'm very happy to once again be able to present to you on the show Amelia Andersdotter, uh, star of the show. Hi, thank you for welcoming me to your program. Thank you for being here. Now, you've been here before. Yes. So I will not go through the easy questions like who are you and what are you doing here and, and actually to be quite frank, I know who you are. I'm grateful that you do. Yeah, and I think our viewers know you as well by now. I hope so. Uh, otherwise, they should see the old episodes of the program. We recommend them highly. Uh, or, or the XL60 webisodes, of course. They're very entertaining. Yes, we, we try to make them so at least. Uh, but today we're going to talk about a topic that has actually also been on the program before. Uh, we're going to discuss data protection. Great, my favorite topic. And, and just to be clear, we like data protection. We like data, data protection. Not everyone else seems to be quite as enthusiastic about data protection as we are. I think a lot of people are very enthusiastic about data protection, but they're not really sure um, how they want to protect the data or what they should be doing about it. And so in the parliament, we have additionally the problem that there's a lot of people that are very anxious to tell people what they should be thinking and how they should be thinking. And that's kind of now um, thwarted our discussions more towards um, can we protect the data and the personal information of private citizens by removing all accountability and responsibility from the private sector because the private sector doesn't like accountability and normally they also don't like liability. And um, it, it's more there that we seem to be having a bit of a problem. Like, are we able to put obligations on, on private sector companies? Now, normally when you say people that like to tell the MEPs what they should think and do, I would guess at assistance. But in this case, I'm guessing that you're aiming at the lobby. Yeah, but the lobbies talk also to the assistance. So I'm not sure that this is a, an MEP only problem. No. You have policy advisors also. So the benefit for assistance and policy advisors, I guess, is that they have more time to spend um, because MEPs do a lot of ceremonial things like they go to meetings and they present and they look good and they look smart and then assistants can spend more time reading or informing themselves about alternative points of views whereas um, MEPs would be restricted in that you only have time to see basically the people who request meetings with you. Which uh, brings us back to the lobby. Which brings us back to the lobby. Or brings the lobby back to the parliament. There's a lot of lobbies in the parliament. Which means that currently the data protection regulation doesn't look that good. Well, so we don't... Um, this is impossible for me to say because I'm not part of the negotiation team now for the new regulation in the... What Committee is the negotiation rights. team? Who's negotiating with whom? Yeah, so we, we've made a new policy process in the, um, in the European Union in order to make us pass legislation faster. And that means that um, after you deal with um, a particular issue in a committee, um, and before the votes, uh, all of the political groups from that committee sit down with one representative from each of those groups um, to ponder whether or not they can reconciliate, like reconcile their differences or if they're just going to vote on the amendments as are. These and are the shadow meetings. They are shadow meetings that are made after the amendment deadline has passed. But so we have 3,000 or more amendments on the data protection file and they go in all directions and they come from all political groups and there's like a whole bunch of them. So in normally in a committee meeting, you don't want to vote on 3,000 amendments separately. And what they're trying to do in these shadow meetings is see are there any amendments that sufficiently go in the same direction that they, um, that they can be reconciled so that the voting list can be made shorter, basically. As we make compromises. Yeah. And uh, this usually works to some extent to reduce the amount of amendments for the committee to vote on. Yes. To make the process a bit faster and a bit clearer as well. If you have very similar amendments, I suppose it could be... It can be used, like in the past, we used to have the situation where a lobby group would ask several different MEPs to table extremely similar amendments um, because you weren't allowed to table the same amendment twice. So you would get um, um, the, the, the amendments where it says um, may, uh, but then the may is replaced by a should, or it's like... Um, uh, should finally agree, should in the end agree, should in yeah. the something like that, uh, may in the end agree, and you would have seven of those in, in the voting list. And so because only one of them can pass, and it's difficult to know which one technically you prefer, because it's mostly a semantic issue. Uh, like It's not a political decision if you're voting for or against that semantic. Yeah. And so semantically that becomes a problem for the parliament. But I think also the compromise process is very, it's sometimes used, it, it's good if you're actually solving semantic problems. 
Um, but the compromise process can of course also be a very, very intransparent way of making policy if what you're solving in the compromises aren't semantic issues but trying to reconcile fundamentally opposing ideas about where society should be and who should be responsible for what. So, so after this uh, not very transparent uh, shadow meeting process, you go, uh, the parliament give the mandate to the rapporteur yeah. to go on the trialogue. No, you have a vote in the committee and so what the committee actually votes on will not be the amendments that the me members actually tabled. So if uh, you've been looking at one of your members of the European Parliament and you notice that they've tabled amendments that, that to you or to your company or to whatever, they seem not to be making a lot of sense, then actually the likeliness that the committee will be voting on those texts are very low. Um, and we don't, basically you... So you as a citizen don't find out what the compromises are before the committee has passed them or not. So what are, what are the, the committee voting on? The well, the committee will vote on the compromises that the shadows have agreed that the committee will vote upon. Mm -hmm. And then when those compromise amendments are passed, um, eventually there will be kind of a final text and it's put to the plenary of the European Parliament, which also has to approve the text, not only the committee, but the rapporteur can request that the plenary doesn't approve the text yet because the rapporteur may want to negotiate with the council first and those are the trialogues uh, when the council and the commission and the European Parliament sit down and they have the three different text proposals from the different institutions and they try again to compromise and reconcile their views. To reach a first reading agreement to as we call it. To reach a first reading agreement. Because Which is quick. Well they're faster and that is normally seen as... Efficient. It, by the council, because member states like to be able to say that they've accomplished something yeah. during their presidency. Statistics, you can say, we passed this many legislative files during our uh, six months. It looks very good on yeah. the CV. Also yeah. for, um, I guess in the parliament, you could argue that we have a strong incentive to finalize files uh, before elections yeah. also. So uh, currently, the data protection regulation might be finalized before the elections because people want it to go fast. Yeah. And. Uh, the current uh, chair uh, of the is Ireland. is Ireland, the chair of the council. Yeah. And Ireland, as far as we know, has been very eager to push the data protection regulation forward. Yeah. Not necessarily to push a strong data regulation forward. They, I think they prefer haste over, over quality. And I'm not, what I'm not really sure of is how they've made their because there's been a few leaks from the council negotiations, right? And I don't really see, they want more clarity, but actually um, the text proposals that are in the council now are anything but clear. So they had the, the, the perfect examples of how you uh, introduce conditional wording into the regulation to make it more clear. Conditional wording means that there's a condition. It is less clear. If you wanted to be very clear in your legislation so that everybody would know kind of what is expected of them, what kind of values we are looking to uphold, um, you would be codifying those types of values very kind of stringently. You would not be talking about how the regulation is overly prescriptive because overly prescriptive means that you have a clear intention. And so this is kind of the problem, I guess, also that we're having in the parliament that we're, we're mixing up we're mixing up what different things mean in, in law. We don't have a sound legal reasoning about this. We have an intention that everyone agrees on that we have, which is that the privacy of the European citizen is important. It's a fundamental right. It's in the European Convention of, of Human Rights. But then we don't want to describe our goals with this too carefully, actually, because that for some reason will bring unclarity if, if it is clear what we want. But to be fair, we don't really know what the parliament wants yet because we're not there, they're still negotiating. Yeah, but, but so what the parliament say that they want. I mean, if you want to go and find me a member of the European parliament that say they don't like the European Convention of Human Rights and they don't uh, think no, that no, privacy no, no, no. should be protected, I challenge you to do this. Of course they will say that. Uh, challenge accepted. I will find that MEP for you. Okay, I'm looking forward to seeing that. Um, my experience is that it's very easy to express a vague support for a principle that was put in a convention in 1952. Yeah. And then when it comes down to doing the actual legislative work, you're not really thinking about what you're trying to uphold. Um, and it's also, but frankly, we're in a big mess of a lot of misinformation also. And we're extremely heavily pressured by lots of interest groups that 
want a particular problem formulation and it's not it's not so easy to weed out what's correct or not. And to counter that pressure to some regard, uh, the Greens want to put another pressure on the parliamentarians from the public. Well, we hope that we will get citizen participation to help contact MEPs and um, spread information to other citizens, maybe have uh, greater media coverage on these issues. Um, and I think citizens can really make a big impact. But, but we're not only hoping, we're actually doing stuff yeah. to, to this endeavor as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, the campaign site? www.respect-my-privacy.eu Yes. Um, and so there's many good videos there. There's also some kind of um, actually very good justifications for why data protection and, and privacy are good values in a society. We have them for a reason and they make it easy also to write to your MEPs and um, it, uh, I guess send postcards you can do but maybe not from Respect my privacy? No, that's from another campaign. It's from another campaign site, but... Um, oh, by the way, it's called nakedcitizen.eu. You might visit that as well. And it's, they're actually very good campaigns, both of them. And so we've been working a lot with the videos and they explain also very well what kind of problems you're likely to run into. Um, and to draw some attention to the campaign, there will also be a press conference in Strasbourg uh, this coming Wednesday. Yeah, 10, 10 a.m. And it will be live streamed. And, and if we have really if we're really lucky someone will actually add the link right here somewhere here uh, to this video otherwise you will just see uh, mob shaking his hand around yeah yeah like very this strangely is, this is how big fish i didn't <laughs> caught last time i was fishing uh, yeah. or it could be a website or it could uh, be a website yeah let's hope for the website we hope for the website yeah. So, so there people can actually watch the press conference where uh, the videos are presented. Yeah. And, and hopefully this will draw some attention. And it will be in many different languages. So we'll be having translation into, I guess, five languages. Mm -hmm. And we'll also be having members from many different member states that, that you can get in touch with if you're looking for, for a national representative who's on, on the whatever good side. Um, and of course, if, if anyone wants to get involved in the data protection campaign, they can also contact our office uh, in, and through any of the channels. we will make sure that they get, yeah. get in contact with yeah. the right people and that they find useful things to do, yeah. yeah. Well, uh, with those uh, uplifting words, I think we should wrap up for today. I'm, yeah. I'm uh, pleased, as always, to have you here. Um, and uh, it's, I hope you've been enjoying the show as well. And we'll see you again in two weeks. Thank you for coming. Thank you for having me.